Okay, hi everybody. So as we mentioned, please hold your questions to the end. If you do have a burning question about something we're talking about, go ahead and raise your hand. I'll make sure to scan for that. But if it's just a general question, um, feel free to hold that to the end and we'll make sure that we save some time for that. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so Trung, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your business? Uh, well, I mean, Marcus did a really good job <laughs> reading my bio. It sounds so much better when someone else reads it than when you write it. Uh, but yes, I have been in uh, food manufacturing for the last 15 years. It is a family business. My father started it way back when in the 80s, and we started as a little sandwich shop in Chinatown. And I grew up in the business. So as a little kid, I was there every weekend uh, running around Chinatown. And when I was old enough to stand on top of a milk crate, I was a cashier. Uh, you know, grew up in Hawaii. I was born in California, grew up here. Went away for college, uh, got a degree in mechanical engineering because I thought that's what I wanted to do. My focus was in hybrid vehicle technology. So, it, so I had a lot of fun doing that. Then when it came time to graduate, uh, all the jobs that were available were in Detroit. And I didn't really want to move to Detroit. And anyone here in engineering? If you're a mechanical engineer in Hawaii, most likely you're going to be working in HVAC, air conditioning, and I didn't want to do that here. Came back. Uh, got a master's in business, uh, opened the Bali sandwich shop on campus. So I opened that in 2004, I believe, is when we opened. Got a master's and then worked in the family business the whole time. Uh, like I said, our business is food manufacturing, specifically baking. We do a lot of bread here. Uh, the business grew from the Vietnamese sandwich bread from the 80s. And as people liked our product, we expanded into croissants, dinner rolls. We started doing sandwiches for an airlines. And then uh, in the early 2000s, we hired an actual baker because my dad is not a baker. He was just an immigrant. He worked odd end jobs. So we, we decided, you know what, maybe it's time for an actual baker. We hired him. His name's Rodney. He's great. And ever since we hired him, it's grown quite a bit. We moved locations in 2010 into our new facility. We have like a 60,000 square foot baking facility now. And we do a little over $22 million in revenue a year. And it's impressive because when you're talking about a loaf of bread, that's like 30, 40 cents. It's a lot of bread to get to yeah. that number. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, I guess it's kind of a business. We have restaurants, the Tour Cafe. Have you folks been? Hopefully not everyone because that means we can keep growing. But yes. <laughs> please check us out. We do soups, salads, sandwiches. We used to do pizzas. We don't do that anymore. But people come for our macarons and our Queen Amman pastries as well. Five locations across the island. Awesome. So as you mentioned, you do have a background in mechanical engineering and business together. What inspired you? I guess you touched on this a little bit, but what specifically made you go into the food and restaurant versus anything else? Um, you know, I've always been interested in all industries, like not just food and beverage, but that's kind of what I grew up in. Mm -hmm. And if you think, maybe it's a good time to tell the story. If you look at people's last names, like, you know, like the Smiths, there's a reason why the name Smith, because their families were probably blacksmiths or in, back in the day. And uh, growing up, I've always been taught that family is very important. So when I graduated, my parents actually asked me, please come back and help us. My mom had been working uh, with my dad for, gosh, at that point, like 20 something years. And they worked like 18 hour days. So that's a lot of time to work with someone. And she's like, please come back <laughs> so you can work with your dad and I can take a break. And by break, she means retired. So once I joined, she's like, you're good? I was like, yep. And she's like, OK, I'm out. And she's been <laughs> retired right. ever since. So uh, it was kind of like a partially family duty. But also, it's a cool business to see it grow from a little shop in Chinatown to where it is now. Like, I got to do a lot of things you don't normally get to do in, in, a, in a bigger business. Like, I got to do with like real estate contracts, construction, planning, like things you don't give like a 22-year-old to do. But like no one else was going to do it, so they just gave it to me. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely learned a lot right. doing that. So how did your educational background, since it is a little bit more diverse, help with the early phases of expanding and then Latour Cafe? Um, I feel like in college, what you're supposed to do is you're really learning how to learn, right? Uh, certain industries like business and, and engineering in particular, like they teach you like frameworks, right? Marketing frameworks, accounting frameworks, and engineering frameworks to how do you look at a problem? How do you build a plan? And I think that's very flexible. You can apply that in pretty much your entire life in any, any part of it. And to me, that's probably the, the greatest thing I took away from my time in school. It's just how to look at things. And you kind of take it for granted being in, in, in college and being surrounded by like-minded folks. 
And once you're out in the real world, you, you realize that you were blessed to be taught these things and to have this knowledge that other people don't have. You know, I, I'm a little bit older, so I was like early days of internet stuff. So you folks have like, like YouTube didn't, YouTube started when I was in college, right? So that's how old I am. So the fact that if you have a question, you can just Google it and YouTube it, like that, that was exciting to see. And that's, unless you were in college at the time or in high school where you hadn't used that to learn, that's not, it doesn't come naturally. So I think uh, that's probably the best thing I learned in school is just that skill, how to look at a problem and how to find a solution to it. Got it. So did Latour Cafe exist when you were first getting into it or was it a little bit different? The, the cafe ex uh, opened in 2011. So okay. my brother, myself, and a couple of our chefs opened it. And it, it basically came about uh, because for a little while before, we were still called Bale. Uh, Bale is the Vietnamese sandwich shop that everyone knows. And when we hired that baker, we started doing like fancy stuff like uh, sourdoughs and cranberry walnuts and like these other things. And we, we, we would open at farmer's markets and we would have a booth with like 30 products. And people were like, oh, this is really great. Who is this? Like Bali, Bali is the, the Vietnamese sandwich shop, right? So we, we noticed there was a bit of confusion with the name. Yeah. So we decided to do a brand switch to Latour, which uh, it's about Latour, the Eiffel, Eiffel Tower. So the Bali logo has an Eiffel Tower. The Latour logo has an Eiffel Tower. So we wanted to be related, but not exactly the same. So the Bali sandwich shop name goes to just the shops and Latour is the bakery. And then people were asking us like now that we have all these breads, because people in Hawaii aren't used to sourdough bread, they're used to sliced white bread and wheat bread, that's what they know. So they were asking us, what do we do with this bread? So we thought, oh, there was two questions. What do we do with bread? And how can I buy this bread? Not just once a week, I wanna buy it every day. Um, so we said, okay, let's open a little restaurant. So we had a concept for a restaurant we would show people what to do with the bread. Like we would have sandwiches and burgers using the bread and they would have a little retail shop selling bread, right? They, oh, this is great, easy. No one bought a single loaf of bread. Like <laughs> everyone said they want to do that. So lesson is like, even people say they want to do something doesn't mean they're going to do it, right? <laughs> Make sure they actually do it before you uh, open anything. Um, so we took away the retail, we added more seating and we just focused more on the food side. And, and luckily, we had made macarons for years before that, but no one really knew about it. But when we opened the restaurant and put it front and center, that's when people realized, like, oh, this, what is this thing? It's kind of neat. And they started buying it. Got it. So what were some integral steps that you felt that you guys took that really set you guys up for success in the early stages of Latour Cafe? Uh, we, my, both my brother and I had a lot of experience in supply chain, so we knew like, how to source ingredients. Uh, because we opened up sandwich shops at the Bale and other shops before, we knew kind of how, what kind of products customers looking for, what kind of price points we should be targeting, what kind of products we wanted to make. And we had a manufacturing facility that could create at scale. Sometimes it's hard when you start off, say in a restaurant, just one shop, like where do you store all your ingredients, right? Um, what price do you set up? What happens to all your excess inventory? Who do you order from? How do you get the best pricing? We had a network already set up with our other business where going to a vendor and saying, I want to open a restaurant, they were fine with us doing it because we had a track record of doing it. And I think it's challenging for a lot of new people who want to break into the industry to say like, oh, I'd make the best tacos. And people are like, why would I give you money to open a taco stand? And, and we had a relationship with banks. And restaurants, um, you can open restaurants for pretty cheap if you want to start really small, but to do it like a full build out can run anywhere from like 400,000 to like a over a million dollars. And that's a lot of money to put down on a, untested concept. So we were lucky that at the time in 2011, the economy was coming back up. Not quite the peak it's at now, but the banks were lending. And because we had previous experience, we were able to get a loan. Got it. So how did you set yourself apart from other cafes in your industry then? Oh, that's like a thing we try to do every day. Mm -hmm. um, we, we try not to do anything normal. So if you ever see anything normal on the menu, it's not my choice. I, would, I, I hate normal things. So we do everything weird. And it's kind of our mission. So our mission is uh, to pioneer fun and modern flavors in food. Um, so we try to look at either traditional things or flavors that you don't normally see in sandwiches or, or in burgers. And we just try to throw it in there and see what sticks out. Um, we do focus on fun. Like every year we do a April Fool's macaron. Uh, we've done nacho cheese last year. The year before was uh, wasabi macarons. We have a good one this year. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but check it out. It's going to be a fun one. Um, and again, it's like there's a lot of cafes, right? We, we're not the only sandwich shop. We're not the only coffee shop where we don't, we're not the one that makes burgers. 
It's about experience now because you can get food pretty much anywhere. And, and hopefully most restaurants are pretty good. It's been a while since I've been to a really bad restaurant. So like the food everywhere is pretty darn good, especially in Hawaii. So how do you differentiate yourself? It's more on the experience, right? Like, well, what's the style, fast casual versus fine dining? Uh, how do they order? What's the experience sitting down? Uh, what's the menu look like? How does it feel to eat the food, the flavors that they get? And so we try to focus on that. Got it. So have you had any of those unique flavors that were a little too unique for customers that you wanted to Yeah, take on? so we have like four chefs on staff um, and we try so many different things that never make it to the menu. Right. Uh, I think we tried like a, there's a weird miso thing that did not. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there are people who ask us like they, because when we do the tasting, it's like 10 things at a time and it's in the restaurant. So people sitting next to us always ask, like, oh, what is that? I'm going to try it. And we let them try it, obviously, and then we get feedback from them. But uh, maybe of every 10 things we try, maybe two make it to the menu, if we're lucky. Right. So when you're looking for product market fit, a lot of it is just in the restaurant and you'll have actual customers come test things out? Uh, sometimes. Right now, because we, we are fortunate enough to have a culinary trained staff, we kind of do most of the, the testing. We know who our target audience is and what kind of flavors they're looking for. Right. Um, but we... It's good and bad. Like we, we target females in the age range of 18 to like early 40s, but a lot of our locations are in areas where we have a lot of mixed customers. So like our main location in Ivale, it's, uh, it's right by Home Depot and Lowe's, right? So you get the construction workers. There's dock workers across the street. There's office workers next door at the Nimitz Center in like insurance and whatnot. And then we have the Best Buy. <laughs> And we have the downtown crowd coming. So we try to focus on a certain crowd, but like everyone kind of comes and eats. So it's really hard to say um, exactly what our target audience thinks as opposed to what everyone thinks. Right. So who do you believe then is your biggest competitor? Um, our biggest competitor is ourselves. No, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm told, which is really funny. Our biggest competitor is, for a lot of people, it's like Zippies. Oh, interesting. And I, and I even think Zippies. Seems very different. We're competitors, yeah. which is really funny. Um, I didn't see, I've never seen it that way because I feel like I grew up eating here, right? So I think Zippies is just Zippies. And what we do is, um, is different, but they tried doing macarons and Queen Amons. Uh, feel free to go try it. Tell me what you think. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say one way or the other. But yeah, it's not an easy, those are not easy products to make. Uh, I guess any, any place you'd go for lunch, business lunch, is, it would be a competitor. But in Hawaii, um, the, the pool is so small. The market's very small here, right? We, we think we're a big place. There's a million people here, but if you go anywhere else, we're, we're tiny, right? And for us to worry about local com competition is kind of like missing the big picture. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone's goal, goal is to expand beyond Hawaii, and we should encourage other companies in Hawaii to do the same. So when Zippy's was looking to expand, you guys know they're going to Vegas, right? Yeah. And so they're opening a huge facility there to produce. They even asked us like, if we wanted to come with them. Right? So this, it's this partnership, this collaboration of like, you know, Hawaii's small. If we're going to go out, we should go as a group. All right? So yeah, I guess in a sense, we are competitors with almost any restaurant. Right. But we try not to focus on local competition at all. Definitely. So what are some of the biggest challenges you face today in terms of whether it be expansion or um, maintaining high traffic rates in your Latour Cafe? Well, the biggest problem that's been going on for years now is our unemployment rate. It's really low, which means everyone that really wants a job kind of has a job. Uh, and the food business is really bad. It's really, really bad. So almost every restaurant is at least one or two person short. And it's just there's not enough people to do the, to do the work. So you do see a lot of restaurants closing. A lot of mom and pop shops are closing because their kids don't want to take over. And it's not like they can hire people to run the business because no one wants to work. Um, so that's the biggest challenge. And I don't see that ever going away. It's kind of just a quirk of being in Hawaii where unemployment's always going to be kind of low uh, because we have a lot of people who work in the tourism industry, a lot of government workers. Like those are our big industries, right? And they're pretty, pretty good jobs. They pay pretty well compared to the food industry. And food industry is good for like your first or second job as, as a career, unless you really love food, like love food, I don't recommend as a career. Um, it's, it's a tough business. But that's why our, our focus is on outside of Hawaii in areas where unemployment's not the issue and you have other things to deal with. But especially with the COVID-19. Yeah. COVID-19's an issue, right? Everyone's yeah. worried about going out to eat. And I mean, we talked about earlier, maybe 
Fight Squad might do really well at Grubhub because people don't want to go out. They just order food and have it delivered. Pizza's probably going to do really well now. Uh, and I, I heard a lot of, it's unfortunate, there's, even in Hawaii, there is racial discrimination. Like Chinatown, a lot of the Chinese restaurants are really, really slow for some reason. Like Lamb's Kitchen, which usually has a line every day, is slow. People aren't buying Corona beer. I don't know why. <laughs> like, I mean, it's extreme. It's extreme. Like, what's the beer have to do with this? It's the association. Like, you, you guys see that? They offer, what, $10 million to rename uh, the, the coronavirus is something else. <laughs> and 15 million if they rename it to Bud Light virus or something. <laughs> Good marketing department they have there. But yeah, that's, I mean, they're suffering and what, there's no relation between the two. Right. So it's kind of a little bit of um, out of your control. But you know, restaurants, are, they're cleaning more. They're trying to wipe down the tables as much as they can. But that's time and energy away from other things they could be doing, right? Mm -hmm. So it's tough. But labor is probably number one still. Definitely. So were there any big failures or I guess just significant failures that you were learning from um, during every point up to here in Latour Cafe? Oh yeah, we fail every day. Where's that poster? There's a poster there. So, oh, entrepreneur yeah, yeah. Entrepreneurship yeah. is about failing, failing fast and using failure to find something better. What, what that doesn't say is there's a reason why you want to fail fast is because failing fast is cheap. If you fail slow, it gets really expensive. So let's say you work on like a product and you think it's good and you're like, I need to buy this machine to do it. And you do all this planning and all this time and then you sell it and then it flops. That's a very expensive failure, right? Whereas if you make something and it, and it sucks right away and you, you just kill it, then it's, it's really cheap. And failing fast is important because in business, like you, the money is what fuels you, right? Your burn rates. Anyone have their own business? Anyone have their own business? Right? So it's like when you, ha you have limited money, right? So the more you spend without the money coming in, like the, the faster you're gonna go out of business. So you really wanna control how much you spend more than anything else. And for us, failure is important because we try to push fun and modern, like we try really weird things, right? And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. We had pizza on the menu for six or seven years and we just killed it. And the reason why is as a business, it didn't make sense when you order a sandwich and it takes six minutes versus a pizza that takes 15 to 20 minutes. It's a, it's a weird mix to have. And were our pizzas bad? No, people love their pizzas, but it just didn't fit in our model. And it did for a while. We thought it was cool to have, because we're a bakery, we make pizza, why not, right? But now it's like going forward, if we want to expand, we couldn't do that anymore. And that, that unfortunately was a, a slow failure. So it was kind of expensive because we had these big pizza ovens doing nothing. We had a lot of like upset customers who Every time you post something on social media, like, bring back pizza. <laughs> and I'm like, no. <laughs> I don't say no. I'm not allowed to post on social media. <laughs> I have someone else doing that. But yeah, I just might open a pizza restaurant or something. Yeah, maybe. That'd yeah. be fun. So what inspired you to create and sell macarons specifically? That was from our baker. And uh, he introduced that to me a long time ago. And he says, this is cookie from France. It's pretty popular in Europe. Didn't really hit Hawaii. And we sold it for a while in our bakery. No one bought it. Because it's expensive, right? Or it's expensive. Mm -hmm. Until everyone tries to make it, and they're like, oh, that's why this thing is so expensive. Because it's made with almond flour instead of wheat, and almonds are expensive. And it's a meringue, and if you mix, over mix it or under mix it, the whole batch is gone. And when you're making like 3,000 a day, and if you make a bad batch, you're gonna throwing away a lot of macarons. So it's expensive, and we're not even that expensive. Like we're like $2 or something. You go to the mail, and they're like three or four bucks. Yeah, they're expensive but, for sure. Um, and we just thought it was it's a, it's a fun platform. You can do a lot of flavors with it. Uh, there's like eight or nine flavors there. And you know we, we always test, we do a flavor of the month. Mm -hmm. um, what we're gonna launch soon is, I don't think I told anyone this. You guys can be the first to know. Like we're gonna do like set flavors we wanna collaborate. Like one of our core values is collaboration. And we're looking at what Hawaii brands can we collaborate with? Like what if we did like a shave ice flavor macaron box? Right? What if we did Hawaiian sun, like all the juice flavors, but mm -hmm. in a macaron? All right, so we're, we're trying to, what a crack seed stores, right? If you took like salted lemon, like everyone eats salted lemon gummy bears, lemon peel gummy bears. Yeah, that's kind of a trend. You guys gotta be on trend, come on. <laughs> lemon peel gummy bears, it's a thing. Right, so we're trying to find ways to collaborate with local businesses that we think people would like to try in like a macaron and, and do that. So um, it's a great product, it's unique. Not everyone does it, it's, it's difficult to produce. So mm -hmm. you have a moat. So it's not anyone who's gonna open up a, a macaron shop tomorrow. It's a challenge. Uh, so we think we have an advantage there. And a lot of people from the man, mainland who come and try it, 
uh, they say ours is much better than what they have in their cities. So we think we have an opportunity there. I've had them. I can, I can verify. I'm from the mainland. <laughs> um, so at what moment did you feel it was time to start growing and expanding to new locations? So um, we opened in 2011. Pretty quickly, someone approached us to open a second location. Uh, we weren't ready. And unfortunately, we, uh, not greed, I guess our, our pride got the better of us and we thought we're ready for a second location and then it didn't really work out. Uh, the pricing was wrong, the product mix was wrong. And the second location, which was in downtown, uh, closed, even though like our rent was super cheap there. It's just the, the margins were not where it needed to be. So we actually waited another two years before we opened our third, our second, second location, I guess, mm -hmm. which is our third location. That was in Pearl City. And we used, uh, we did a Groupon, this is back when Groupon was popular, uh, Groupon deal to see where people bought it. Because when you buy, they tell you what zip codes everyone bought the Groupon from. And there was a pretty big concentration in that Pearl City, uh, Waipahu area that was really interested in it. So, okay, we're gonna look at Pearl City. And this was a uh, Pearl City Gateway, which is kind of by Walmart. And I went over there and take a look, took a look at it. There were a couple of spaces available. There was a lot of, what I, what I noticed was in the parking lot, there were a lot of, nice new cars, like they were like BMWs and Mercedes. Okay, this is our clientele, right? Like we're, we're kind of higher end, we're not cheap food. So I noticed that, you know, the kind of people that were there were like our target customers. And when we opened it, um, we opened that with like a $400,000 budget, like very bare bones, um, but it did really well. Like uh, the only time it didn't do well was when the rail construction went through. That killed our business by like 20%. And we weren't even on the rail route. We were like two blocks up, but it still affected us. Uh, significantly. And then we, we sat on that one for a little bit. Um, and then kind of three, four, and five, which is Aina Haina Kapolei and Wimut Mall, kind of happened fast. Uh, we actually did the Kapolei deal first, but then Aina Haina popped up between the time we were planning Kapolei. So we ended up opening Aina Haina before Kapolei. But within the span of two or three years, we had all three stores opened up. And the way we look at it is we do this kind of, we talk about failing, right? So what we do is we, we do something crazy right and then it breaks and then we work on fixing it and we get it back to something we think is good and then we're like okay we're ready and then we open another one introduce like all these other like variables like when you go from one location to two like it's hard right now you have double the staff managers how does your supply chain work but what's really hard is going from two to three because with two locations one person can drive back and forth right but three like it doesn't work anymore you have to hire like kind of like regional managers now now I have this one person you're paying a salary to that doesn't really uh, add revenue. They're just kind of there watching the stores. And then at three, you might as well go to five because that same person that can handle three can handle five. So we had to grow really fast. And Coppola was probably our biggest uh, store. That was almost, it's like 2,500 square feet and it costs like a million dollars. Don't do that. Don't spend a million dollars on a restaurant. It was so bad. Like I, I run the construction projects. I'm there like the whole time. I was so sick of it that when we're mall, I was like, I'm gonna spend as little money as possible. And I think we spent 40,000 to open when we're mall versus a million. Uh, different businesses, of course, but yeah. Uh, yeah. But I think we're good for now. Labor's really bad here, so we're not looking at opening any more locations in Hawaii. If anything, uh, we'd be looking to expand outside of Hawaii. Got it, so if you did, decide to expand outside of Hawaii, would you make any changes in your menu offerings, your business model? Uh, for sure. We're going to definitely trim the menu down even more. Like pizza was just the first cut, but uh, people buy our macarons, they buy our queen of mons. Our number one items are French dip, which is uh, made with a Snake River Farms Wagyu from the mainland. So we know that if we needed to source it uh, when we're on the U.S. mainland, it would be easy. Whereas if we use some kind of, we use a local beef in our burger now, which is fine for Hawaii, but if we were to expand, we, we obviously can't ship Hawaii beef. It doesn't make any sense to ship Hawaii beef out there. <clears throat> so um, we're definitely gonna trim back because when you do like a franchise or a license model, they want a really simple business to run. And we, even now, as, as simple as it may look on the outside, it's pretty complicated running a restaurant. We have like over a hundred ingredients that they have to stock and keep an eye on. It's a lot of work. Definitely. Um, so you mentioned a little bit, as we were talking in the beginning, that you guys also do some 
you don't just, you're not purely just like a cafe. People come and sit in. What other stuff right. are you guys involved in? Uh, so that's the bakery side. Right. Uh, we're a wholesale bakery. That's where majority of the money comes in from. So the $22 million I was talking about is just a bakery. The cafe is a separate company. But the bakery, uh, we do, our number one customer is Papa John's Pizza, actually. So we make all their fresh dough here. We also bring in their, all the, the cheeses, the meats, all the ingredients. We, we ship it in from the mainland. We store it at our warehouse and we deliver to all their locations twice a week, each location. Uh, we also do Hawaiian Airlines uh, meals. Anyone been on the airlines lately, Hawaiian Airlines? You guys had the, like a chicken pesto hot pocket looking thing? No? <laughs> yeah, we make that. So we make that for them. Uh, Kahala Hotel, we do like chocolate covered Mac nuts. We have a chocolate room that does just random chocolate stuff for different hotels. We're in retail more, so Whole Foods, um, Costco, Times, all the supermarkets with our shokupan, Japanese bread. Uh, our, our goal is, and my, my brother runs that side more than I do, but our goal is to be Hawaii's bakery. And right now Hawaii's bakery is Love's, but we think mm -hmm. we can do a better job than Love's. Yeah. So we're going to try and take that title from them, see how it goes. Uh, focus on more uh, local bread production, fresh products. Uh, what else do we do in that room? Gosh, we do so much stuff. Um, we make over 700 different things in that bakery. Not every day, but uh, we, we have in our, in our system 700 different items. And uh, there's a new law that was passed in 2016 called the Food Safety Modernization Act, FISMA, which requires any food production that gets audited by the feds uh, to comply with certain guidelines. And one of the big ones is lot tracking. So I need to be able to tell anyone there's a recall. If someone gets sick from eating a loaf of bread, which doesn't happen, uh, where the flour came from, where the salt, where the butter, where the oil came from. And then let's say I buy it from the distributor. They need to be able to tell me where they got it from and trace it all the way back to who, whoever grew it. It's a pretty, it's a pretty comprehensive change and it's a lot of work and even big companies aren't really quite there yet um, but we're, we're we're getting there too but because of that we're, we're not going to be able to do 700 different items anymore we'll probably have to cut back and a lot of small bakeries who wa might want to do federal work like uh, airline work will not be able to compete because it's a lot of paperwork it's a lot of paperwork so how and when did you guys get into the distribution side um, when, when we do hotels, we kind of distribute our own products, but our, the majority of our distribution is Papa John's Pizza. Like That's probably 80% of the distribution we do. Mm. And we started that in 2004, and we did everything for them, maybe a little earlier than that. Okay. So you've been doing that more than the actual Latour Cafe, or longer, I guess. Right, right. So the bakery's been in business 36 years, 36 years. Got it. Okay. Interesting. So... How did you shape your company culture then when you were getting started up until now? Uh, for the bakery, it's a very much small business, single owner mindset of culture. Like my dad's kind of the boss and whatever he says goes. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's kind of taken that style and expanded it even with the size we are now. Uh, we do have a transition plan in place where my brother's supposed to be taking over. My dad's going to be retiring. And we're going to shift the culture to more of like a team mindset, which uh, works much better when you're the size we are. Mm -hmm. At the cafe, uh, I don't like to micromanage. So I do try to empower my staff to, to make decisions on their own and kind of come up with plans and solve their own problems. A lot of them have a hard time with that because they didn't grow up in an education uh, world where they teach what they teach now, the self-directed learning, the... And you guys, pub, anyone public school, high school, public school? There you go. So your GLOs, you guys remember GLOs? All, right, all that stuff, that's important. They didn't teach that before. But all those things you're learning, like a lot of people who are in the workforce now never learned that, right? So they expect their bosses to have the answers. So when they stuff it, just stand there and do nothing and they wait for you to tell them what to do. And that, to me, that doesn't work. Like, I yeah. don't, don't want to do that. I want to micromanage people to that level. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so our culture is definitely... We make a lot of mistakes, but we fix as fast as we can. Uh, we apologize, <laughs> and then we just move on. Right. Yeah. So what advice, then, would you give to students who are potentially looking to break into the food and restaurant industry? Besides don't? <laughs> <laughs> That's the first piece of advice I always give someone. Like, don't, because it's really, really hard. Your margins are very small, like really, really small, mostly because I don't have my phone. You have your iPad, right? 
That thing costs probably like $200 in parts, but how much does it retail for? More than like $200. A thousand bucks, right? Say $1,000. Yeah. <laughs> Why? It's because if you had to make that, like you couldn't, you couldn't do it. So you, you pay the premium, it's worth it. You, you, you look at a burger, you see the bun, you see the burger patty, the tomato, the lettuce, like you could make that, right? So how much more are you willing to pay for that than going to the supermarket? Like it's, it's much smaller. You're not gonna pay a thousand bucks, right? So um, restaurants work with a much smaller margin, right? And then even if you sell more burgers, you're still making just very small amounts of money. And unless you really, really love food, it's almost not worth it because you deal with like customers that sometimes are not the happiest. You have employees that call in sick, you have supply chain, you have waste. There's a lot of things that make that small margin into a negative margin. And most of the people who do it and do it well, they, they do well because they love food. Like they just, they just can't see themselves doing anything else mm -hmm. and they stay in it. Like Definitely. for me, it's a family business. So I kind of grew up in it. If I were to start again today, I probably would not be in the restaurant business because um, it's, it's so tough. But it is fun. It's a lot of fun. But I, I mean, I'm fortunate enough where the, the bakery makes enough money where the cafe profits is important, but not critical. I'm not going to like starve if we make a little bit less money this month than we did last month. Right. So if you were to start a completely different business today, what would you start? That's a tough question. Tough question. Uh, I have a book. Um, full of silly ideas of businesses I would start. And it's probably like, probably have like 40 pages filled in there. Uh, random things from like, a, anyone drive a moped? Okay. Oh, okay. So I really don't like the sound of mopeds. <laughs> so we, in, in Hawaii, we have like moped rentals, right? See the tourists are driving around. Uh, they, there's a company in Taiwan called Gogoro and they do electric mopeds. And they have this really cool technology where um, Instead of charging it, plug in, you just swap the batteries out. And there's these cool terminals where you just swap, plug and play, and you put them in 7-Elevens really fast. So I would want to create like a, like a moped rental business, but electric mopeds only, because you get ecotourism. Right. You get this distribution network of charging stations around the island where you can, you can, vendors can pay you to put your charging station there. It's like 7-Eleven would be great, because you can charge your battery or swap your batteries and get a spam be. And then I don't have to hear mopeds <laughs> at night anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds perfect. So I know that you do other stuff besides just the food and restaurant side of things. Right. So um, we did some digging yes. and we learned that you do an education based drone racing program. Right. So can you tell us a little bit about that? So because my background is in engineering, I, I, I do some of it in the food business, but not not enough. So I try to scratch that itch anywhere I can. So Jutton's went to Kalani. He was in my club. Uh, I've, four years I did a makerspace, which is kind of like modern day shop, but instead of learning the skills for a job, you learn how to apply that into every, other parts of your life, right? So we do things like self-directed learning. So if they ask me a question that they can either find very easily or figure out on their own, I just kind of give them a blank stare and I don't answer them. Um, and they had to figure out on their own. But uh, through that, I partnered with uh, JCI Hawaii, which is like a, kind of like a, like a club. For, for young adults to join and they do a lot of community work, but they launched a really cool drone racing program. And uh, everyone knows like the DJI drones that take pictures, like those are not racing drones. They kind of just hover in place and they kind of take really nice pictures. These are, I don't have one on me, it's in my trunk, but it's, it's like a <laughs> carbon fiber frame. You see all the parts and wires sticking out and they, they can go like 80 to 100 miles an hour. And what it is is like, it's, it's education based. There's, and I, I was trying to pitch this to Kamehameha schools because like, we wanted them to sponsor it. And we were talking about how like, it's good for careers, it's good for education, and like, it just it was very inauthentic. And like, I like to be authentic. And what we, what we uh, narrowed it down to is what it is, it's, it's like we're teaching people, or we're giving people the chance to fall in love with flying. Because who, who said a dream about flying? Right? Everyone, everyone, don't lie to me, everyone's dreamed about flying, <laughs> right? Like, look at the movies we have. We have the Rocketeer, right? We have Superman, right? Every, flying's cool, and you don't really get to experience that in the way uh, Superman or Rocketeer does. An airplane doesn't really feel like you're flying, just in a room, just making a lot of noise. But when you fly a drone, you wear these goggles, and you get to see exactly what the drone sees. So you get that feeling of soaring up, falling down. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. So we just wanted students to, to get that feeling, to enjoy what that's like, and Doing that, learn, learn 
how to build it. Like what happens when you crash? Like crash is failure, right? Oh, you broke it. But what do you do? You fix it and you learn from your mistakes and you try again. So it, it's kind of like a, you learn all those GLO without really knowing that you're learning them. The self-directed learning, the project-based learning. Got it. So we also noticed that you do the Hawaii Business Podcast. Is that something you're still involved with? Yes, no. No and yes. Okay. <laughs> it's on pause. So I did it for about two years and it, it stemmed from the fact that in Hawaii, uh, people have really awesome stories, but because we're a local culture, we don't, like to, we don't like to boast, right? So everyone's really quiet about what they do. Mm -hmm. But when you meet them in person, they'll tell you. They'll tell you what they're doing, what they're working on, how well it's working, how well it's not working. And I was like, man, I wish there was a way to hear all these stories about these local businesses. So we started a podcast called Hawaii Business Podcast. It was a very creative name. Um, and I basically just interviewed people that I thought had really cool ideas. So uh, first guest was uh, Juno Chung, who owned Koa Pancake House. Like, he was my oh, brother's yeah. really good friend, so it was an easy one to start. But it was really interesting because we talked about the restaurants, but like, it came about like his uh, mental health and how he was depressed and how doing certain things helped him. So it was really cool to hear this side that you don't normally see. It's like, oh, they sell Colby and pancakes. What does that have to do with it? What, why is that exciting? But hearing the story from the founder is it's much more exciting. Uh, we've had people like, we had someone from the FBI talking about like different crimes he sees in Hawaii. We had this really cool guy. This is the, this is the best one. His job is he's a Korean Elvis impersonator. That is his job. <laughs> he's a Korean guy and he impersonates Elvis. But what you don't know is there's a reason why he did it is he was in the military and on his way back from like a visit in town, he was in a car accident. A really bad one where his head was, it was really bad. Um, and the doctors were worried he was in a coma. Like the, the doctors were worried he would never come out. So they needed to play music to kind of stimulate his brain. And the only CD they had in the hospital was an Elvis CD, right? So they put it on his head. And then when he woke up, his inner voice was no longer his inner voice, it was Elvis. Like Elvis is his inner voice. <laughs> and like he was like he was a hardcore rap guy before the accident. Afterwards, all he listened to was Elvis. And it's an amazing story. Like all he does now is like just share Elvis stuff with everyone. That's so cool. It's super cool. <laughs> but like they, they, I would never meet this guy yeah. for this podcast. Um, so we did about a little under 40 episodes. Uh, stopped because my calls uh, had a baby and she needed a break. And we haven't started back up yet. We keep talking about it. But uh, I just found that the Hawaii Biggest Business Magazine just started a podcast mm -hmm. <clears throat> called The Hawaii Business Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe it's time to give them a run for their money and see who's better. Which Hawaii Business Podcast is better? <laughs> so, okay, so I have one more question and then we have a lightning round. Ooh, okay. okay. So what, just to like finish everything out, what is the main thing that you focus on or that keeps you inspired? Um, to keep going in your business, especially in such a tough industry? Um, it, it, probably innovation, the chance to do things that have never been done before. And this goes, ties back into like it being a family business and kind of like the whole Smith thing because I, I tell this story in the club. 10, maybe not 10,000 years ago. 1,000 years ago, let's pretend you're in, you're in Egypt. Like you're in, you're in Egypt, you're working the Nile. If I asked you what your grandkid was going to do, you could probably answer that pretty easily, right? Oh, I farm food to feed my family and sell. My grandkid's going to probably do the same thing, right? In the early 1900s, you probably couldn't tell me what your grandkid did, but your kid would probably be like, oh, I work in a factory, my kid's going to work in a factory, right? Nowadays, I don't know what I'm doing 10 years from now, let alone what, I have three boys. I have no idea what they're going to do when they're adults, right? The jobs that... Like uh, the jobs that I have now may not exist or there might be new jobs out there, right? Like a uh, taxi industry. Right? Who would have thought you would get into a car, a stranger's car and pay them money to take you somewhere, right? Yeah. Right, that's Uber. Uh, if I told you like, you know what? Um, you are going to go to a new city, find someone's house and stay in their room and pay them money for it. That would have sounded crazy before, but that's Airbnb. Right? And all these new industries have popped up because of technology or, or the internet, or whatever you want to call it, that you could never imagine 20 years ago. Like, no one would ever think that was a good idea. Still doesn't sound like a good idea. But we do it, right? So who knows what you folks are going to come up with as an industry and what kind of jobs there will be. So I think 
the good thing about innovation is if you're doing something new, you have no competitors, right? If you open a restaurant, you have a ton of competitors. But if you do something crazy and wild, you have zero competitors. So you are number one in the industry, right? And I think that's exciting to be number one and to be able to play and do weird things. Right. And I try to do that in the restaurant industry, but I have side things that I work on as well to try and push that. Interesting. Okay, we're going to go into the lightning round then. Okay, so we'll just go quick and easy. Let's shoot for like one sentence or less answers for this one. So what is the most played song on your playlist at the moment? Uh, oh, baby shark. <laughs> <laughs> what can't you leave the house without? My cell phone. Hmm. What is the last book you read? The last book I read was, oh my God, Three Body Problem. It's a Chinese author. Yeah. Okay. Favorite podcast that's not your own? Favorite podcast? Uh, the Verge. The Verge cast. The tech podcast. Do you ask permission or beg forgiveness? Neither. <laughs> <laughs> what is your go-to coffee order? A Vietnamese iced coffee. What is one thing you do to get out of a creative or business slump? God, do so many things. Um, hmm. Why do you spend time with my kids? That probably helps the most. Favorite macaron flavor? Ooh, vanilla. Can I add a second sentence yes. to that? Yes. Okay, everyone thinks <laughs> vanilla. vanilla is plain, right? Plain Jane is vanilla. Untrue. Vanilla is one of the most complex flavors in the world. The number of compounds in vanilla, is, there's a lot. So vanilla is not plain. That's all I, that's all I want to say. <laughs> and if you had to live anywhere else, where would you live? New Zealand. Okay, yeah. fun. Okay, that was our lightning round. So. Um, and then we'll just have a little networking event at the end, but I just want to say thank you one more time. I don't know if we could all give them a little round of applause. Thank you. <laughs>